Is a story's ironclad logical basis always the most important thing? So Disney Plus's long-awaited Percy Jackson adaptation has almost wrapped up, and for the most part I've really been enjoying it. I read and loved Rick Riordan's books when I was younger, and there's just something very affirming about seeing a childhood obsession realised this lovingly, this well, and this faithfully. Oh. Is that an asterisk? Now, how did that get there? Let me try that again. Blah blah blah, this well, and this faithfully. Okay, yeah, there is an asterisk there. Let's talk about the asterisk. Despite Riordan's heavy involvement, in fact, as we'll see because of it, a good deal of changes have been made from that original source material, the book Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. Nothing crazy major, it's not like the films again. Oh god, the films. It's more akin to something like Invincible. Bits and bobs have been juggled around, Luke takes a lot of Annabeth's role in camp for instance, and we get to the quest a lot sooner. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing, you couldn't just copy-paste the plot wholesale from 377 pages to 8 episodes. This is a wholly different medium. TV and the novel have different strengths, demands, and restrictions. In an interview with The Direct, executive producer John Steinberg said the following. I think you have to embrace the idea that everything in the book is going to have to find a different form to inhabit in order to be something I'd want to watch on screen. Sometimes it's sequencing, it's causation, it's… the way set pieces play out is a little different, but it made it work better. As a result then, yes, some lines get shuffled around, some characters who did appear don't make it in, and some characters who didn't do, but you can always kinda see why these decisions were made. You know, maybe it's pacing, changes for the benefit of this new eight-part structure. So if we are defining fidelity as pure preservation of plot, of what happens to whom in what order, things like the boys finding the bolt a bit sooner do make the show less faithful, but they don't make it feel less faithful. At least not not to me, or any other book reader, show watchers I've spoken to. Changes like these aren't the only ones the show's made, though. Speaking on the changes, Steinberg continues. Some of it is bigger. Some of them, frankly, are things I think Rick was excited about getting a second go at it. He wrote that book twenty some odd years ago, and you don't get a second draft. Would you do everything the same? Who would do everything the same twenty years later? It seems we can roughly divide the show's changes into two camps then. Camp Jupiter and Camp Hub. One camp would be format changes, and we might term the other redo changes. Things Ryden would maybe put in the book too were he to rewrite it today, either to better structure the series' long-term plotting or to gently reorient the thematic through lines. In this latter category, we might put things like Hermes' appearance or Grover's one-on-one -on -one Ares time. This isn't a hard distinction, of course, some alterations absolutely straddle that line, but I think it is a broadly useful one. And some of these redo changes are killer. The flashbacks, the greater depth the show gives to Percy and Sally's past make for some real highlights. The restaurant scene in episode 7? Kino. Another cool change comes in episode 4, turning Percy's St. Louis drop from a relatively simple strategic flop into healing water into a very literal leap of faith is nice and dramatic, but it also allows this moment to become a key building block in the development of show Percy's more openly tense relationship with the gods. What's more, doing this corrects something of a plot hole in the book. In a blog post from 2007, Ryden describes a Q&A with some readers, writing, The kids asked super questions, including many I'd never thought of before. A big topic of interest was the scene where Percy jumps off the St. Louis Arch. They pointed out that the arch is quite far from the banks of the Mississippi, so how could Percy land in the water? Ryden hadn't realised while writing quite how far the arch is from the river. He'd written Percy as simply dropping into the nourishing water, but that doesn't work. In that moment, Riordan quote, decided that strong winds must have carried him, which yeah, doesn't super work, and the change we see in the show seems to indicate that this little wrinkle never left the writer's mind. It is important for a story to make logical sense with regard to the world it's set in, after all. And here, we see the show adjust for that. And it does seem like that's the philosophy behind a few more of these redo changes, too. 
The broad strokes of The Lightning Thief make it on screen fully intact. We reach the same destination, with the same cast, and so on. But like most books, The Lightning Thief is just as much about the journey as it is the destination, and the bones of that journey are a sequence of modernized mythic episodes. The S.H.I.E.L.D. retrieval mission and Hephaestus's trap, the run-in with the Chimera, the Lotus Casino, Procrustes' bed, and of course, the Medusa confrontation. The books is a very episodic story, part of the reason I and so many others were glad upon hearing Disney's adaptation would be a show, not a film, and for the most part, these are all here, but they're not the same, for the simple reason that in the show, the kids cotton on to the fact that they're in these mythic episodes far earlier than their book counterparts do. Originally, the gang gets fully suckered into the wonderful, almost Wonka-esque attractions of the Lotus Casino, and neither they nor the reader realize the mess they've got into until it's too late. But live action Percy goes into the Lotus, for instance, and instantly clocks, shit, if the gods are hanging about here, there's probably some connection to the Odyssey's Lotus Eaters. Better be on my guard. And this does make sense, obviously. In retrospect, looking at Riordan's original book, it is contrived that these mythic episodes aren't instantly clocked by Annabeth or Grover, who've spent years in Camp Half-Blood and, accordingly, are shown to know their myth inside out. It is kind of a plot hole, at least in the sense that the internet likes to use that term. The Dark Knight Rises, how did Batman get back plot holes, things which seem odd and aren't explained. Sure, there are plenty of ways Bruce could have got back to Gotham. Sure, maybe Annabeth and Grover were just so on edge the whole time that they missed all these red flags, but those answers aren't aren't given, so in internet terms, they're plot holes. The show addresses this, has our questing heroes spot these huge blatant red flags, and most of the time, not necessarily all the time, I think the Casino episode was weaker in this regard, these mythic episodes are rewritten to function well as satisfying problems, even with our protagonists for knowledge. So that's good. Right? Right? Is the thing. Yes, it is important for a story to make logical sense with regard to the world it's set in, but it isn't the only important thing. I think they were right to take this route with, say, Medusa. A bunch of demigods sauntering in through rows of stone statues at Auntie M's would be a bit silly to watch, and as Polygon notes, the new direction the show takes this encounter in feels the better route in our current age of mythological reclamation a la Madeline Miller, but honestly, that's kind of it. I'm not convinced that what's gained from having the gang instantly clock the threat posed by the Lotus Casino, that is, a more immediately coherent plot and world, is worth the loss of the book's episode, its drama, and the very specific riot and charm of a dusty old Homeric threat turned into a hypnotic VR arcade. I'm not convinced even the maybe better revamped water park sequence is worth losing that really ominous mid-ride, oh shit, we're trapped in a god's contraption moment for. I'm not convinced that the rest of these more self-aware rewrites improve on their source material, even though, yes, they do inarguably make more sense. I do think there has been an overcorrection here. We spot Medusa, we we're already trying to outsmart Echidna as we get to the arch, we figure out the nature of Hephaestus' park on the way in, we clock the Lotus Casino, dodge its arcade, and we get the drop on Krusty. Now, there's no rationalization needed. That all makes sense, perfect sense, finally. But where are those delightfully idiosyncratic shocks and surprises, the moments of monstrosity or divinity that hide behind what's familiar to us and catch us by surprise? Sure, they probably shouldn't have been there originally, that didn't make sense, but gods, it made for a great book. Perfect logical coherence is important, but so is style and charm and excitement. So I don't think the kid's curious, mythic blindness makes The Lightning Thief a badly written book, and I don't think the show's corrections all make it better. And I know we live in a post-Cinema Sins world, I know we're all on a YouTube of objective plot analysis, which prizes coherence above all else, so I know this is going to be a hard sell, but if these are plot holes, then maybe, sometimes, plot holes are worth it. I want to be clear that I'm not suggesting the only reason behind any of these redone mythic episodes was a hyper-awareness of plot hole discourse on the part of anyone behind the show. The Krusty episode's alteration makes it a snappy opener for the show's Underworld episode. The Lotus rejig allows the Hermes scene to fit in here to season one, in what is surely an intentional early seeding of certain ideas. Some of these scenes perhaps straddle that redo-slash-format-change division. 
That being said, it is impossible to miss the trend that appears upon taking these redone mythic episodes cumulatively. The trend away from clueless demigods who should know better, toward ones who do, and who, in knowing better, sidestep some of the most charming moments in the original book. I really wouldn't be surprised if, like the St. Louis Leap, part of the impetus behind these changes was an effort to correct perceived oversights, to plug these plot holes. Again, on balance, I'm loving this project. It's already one of my favourite things to come out of the Disney Plus platform, but I do think the show maybe suffers from this, and I hope we see this trend pushed back just a little in future seasons. But that's that, so I'd just like to thank you all for watching this, invite you to drop your thoughts down below, send it to anyone you think would appreciate it, and shout out all my current backers on Patreon and YouTube who help keep this channel going, especially Hanan, Daniel Goldhorn, Karen Kuhlman, Magath, Ryan Emily, Something Something Capitalism Bad, Thomas R, and Weirdy Birdie. Bye.